الحمد لله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ونوله ما بعد Welcome back to our regular Tuesday Q&As but it is not regular uh, as usual I'm speaking to you in these days from our uh, green screen room uh, and uh, we will try to resume a sense of normalcy by resuming our programs that we used to have and as you recall Tuesdays would be our open uh, Q&A session uh, and uh, today inshallah ta'ala I will do a very important question regarding which I have gotten over a dozen emails from around the world uh, last week somebody from Norway emailed me and then today a few last few days I've been getting a lot of phone calls and emails uh, about this issue of the fiqh of uh, the ghusl and the uh, funeral prayers in light of the coronavirus, in light of the fact that uh, things are changing and that um, perhaps you know, the body might be uh, problematic to wash or that the governments are putting extra restrictions. And so in today's uh, Q&A session, inshallah ta'ala, we will discuss the Islamic rulings pertaining to the janazah, pertaining to uh, the taking care of the corpse and pertaining to the uh, salah uh, or the funeral uh, prayer. And uh, as I have said uh, the last uh, you know, few lessons in the last week that really brothers and sisters, um, it does appear uh, that we might be facing uh, one of the greatest uh, potential trage tragedies of our generation. And I'm not saying this to be uh, a fear monger. I'm saying this so that we prepare ourselves if that is the case. And I hope that I'm proven wrong, but uh, it, it does appear the way things are heading that um, we, we do um, have a, a long time ahead of us, uh, perhaps even months or more than this, and uh, we will be tested. And we uh, don't want to be tested, but when Allah chooses to test us, then we seek our refuge in Allah from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We turn to Allah to protect us to protect us and we realize that this is a time that our faith will shine, that our iman will uh, strengthen and guide us. And uh, before I even begin the fiqh of, of the janaiz and whatnot, uh, I remind myself and all of you uh, in the battle of the trench, which was one of the most difficult times for the Muslims when they were surrounded by an army five, ten times their, their quantity, when they did not have any other mechanism to support themselves. Allah says in the Quran, الَّذِينَ قَالَ لَهُمُ النَّاسُ إِنَّ النَّاسَ قَدَ جَمَعُوا لَكُمْ Remember Allah says that when the hypocrites told the believers, when the hypocrites came to the believers and said to the believers, all of mankind has gathered to attack you. You are surrounded by everyone. Aren't you scared? Aren't you terrified? فخشوهم. And Allah Azza wa says, describing the believers, فزادتهم إيمانا. Their iman went up, their iman increased. وقالوا حسبنا الله ونعم الوكيل. They said Allah is sufficient for us and He is all that we need to protect us. So حَسْبُنَ اللَّهُ وَنِعْمَ الْوَكِيلُ At times of stress, at times of difficulty, at times of fear, the mu'min turns to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and their iman goes up and their courage comes from their faith and their strength and their determination comes from up above and Allah Azza wa Jal will then give them the faith that they need to overcome the tragedies that they're going to face. And dear Muslims indeed, it does appear that we're going to be facing uh, some tragedies. Uh, there might be, as Allah says in the Quran, we're going to test you uh, with something of fear and calamity and with the loss of life and with the loss of produce. And the plague is, of course, one of the most terrifying uh, uncertainties. And it is a time of great confusion and hysteria. And it is also a time where a lot of people die. And we do have to prepare ourselves for the possibility that uh, there might be families amongst us who will be affected, maybe even we ourselves will be affected. And we have to remind ourselves that death only comes to us when Allah has decreed. No one can protect against death, but we still take reasonable precautions. Wherever we are, death will come when Allah has preordained it. Nothing can change the time of death. Allah Azza wa Jal has decided it, but that doesn't mean we act foolishly. We act wisely and we prepare and we seek protection from a worldly perspective and we seek protection in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Realize, dear Muslims, that 
Death during the time of a plague is in fact a mercy from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is because we learn from the ahadith that anybody who dies because of a plague during the time of the plague, they shall be blessed with the highest status possible. And that is the status of a shaheed. There are different types of shaheed. There's the shaheed of this world and the akhir, the martyr of this world and the next world. That's the highest category of martyr. And there are those who pass away in the battlefield in a legitimate fight and jihad for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They die defending their homelands. They, they die for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's the highest level of shaheed. They are not given a ghusl. They uh, are not prayed for according to the more stronger position. They are buried as they are and they will have all the blessings of martyrdom in this world and the next. There is another category of shaheed and that is the shaheed of the hereafter but not of this world. The shaheed who will get the rewards of martyrdom in the hereafter but in this world we don't treat them like a a, a martyr. But if they die in a particular manner, as we'll explain in a while, then we expect and we hope that insha'Allah ta'ala they will get the rewards or at least many of the rewards of the shaheed. And that is a type of consolation for us. Anyone who passes away during this trial, during this plague, anyone who loses a family member, anyone who faces the death of a loved one, console yourself, console yourself with the fact that your loved one passed away with the most honorable and the highest level of honor that Allah could bestow on somebody at the time of death, and that is the honor of martyrdom. Anas ibn Malik narrates that one of his students, Yahya ibn Abi Amra, passed away. And so he asked, how did Yahya ibn Abi Amra pass away? And they said he passed away because of the plague. So Anas ibn Malik said, I heard the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say, the plague is the death of shahada for every single Muslim. Hadith is in Sahih Bukhari. The plague is the death of shahada. Anybody who dies during the plague, it will be the shahada for any Muslim. Muslim who dies during the uh, plague. And in another hadith in Abu Dawood, our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, seven are the martyrs who shall be counted as a martyr even if they don't die on the battlefield. So he said, seven types of people, they will be given the blessings of martyrdom even if they don't die on the battlefield. And he began that list. Number one on this list, he said, al matunu shaheed. The one who dies in the ta'un, the one who dies in the plague is a shaheed. And so this is the number one category of martyrdom after passing away in the battlefield. In the hadith in Bukhari, Aisha radiallahu anha says that I asked the Prophet sallallahu about plagues. How do we understand plagues? And our Prophet said that the plague is a punishment that Allah sends on whomever He, please, he pleases and it is a mercy for the believers. So it is a punishment to one group of people, whomever Allah wills, and it is a rahmah for the believers. Then our Prophet said, listen to this hadith, there is not a single believer upon whom the plague comes and he remains in his land patient, expecting the reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, knowing with full certainty that nothing happens to him except if Allah wills it to happen to him, except that that person will get the rewards of a shaheed. This hadith is in Sahih Bukhari. Al-Hafidh ibn Hajar, the famous commentator of Imam al-Bukhari Sahih, Al-Hafidh ibn Hajar said, this hadith is actually broader than the one who dies in the, the plague. Because what does the hadith say? Listen to it carefully. Our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, no one remains in a land of plague patient, sabiran, muhtasiban, expecting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to reward uh, him. Ya'lamu, he knows with certainty that nothing will happen to him except whatever Allah has decreed. Whoever remains patient, expecting Allah's reward, full of faith, that person shall get the reward of the shaheed. Al-Hafidh ibn Hajar says, therefore, anyone who is alive during the time of a plague, and demonstrates these three characteristics, even if they pass the plague, even if they finish the plague alive, insha'Allah ta'ala, they will get the rewards of a shaheed. Muslims, dear brother and sister, don't you want to get the rewards of the shaheed? Well, Allah has given you this chance. Allah has given you an opportunity. This is a gift 
for you and me. This is a gift, what we do in this plague, how we react to this plague, our faith during this plague, our iman, our ihtisab, our sabr, as the hadith says, these three things, if they are good and fine, then insha'Allah ta'ala, we will get the rewards of a shaheed if we die, and even if we don't die, we'll get a longer life, and we'll still get the rewards of a shaheed. What a beautiful gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How can we not accept this gift and then try our best to honor it and then get the rewards of a shaheed. And so we console ourselves, dear Muslims, that Allah has chosen us. Allah has chosen us to get the rewards of the shaheed. Some of us will actually end up passing away in this plague. We've already had cases across the globe of people, Muslims and non-Muslims, and of course the plague affects everybody. Some of us were going to end up meeting our Lord uh, within this plague. Some of us are going to get through this plague. All of us have the opportunity to get the rewards of a martyr, and that is really uh, our goal. And so we begin with this theological you know, uh, response before we get to the fiqh. And by the way, before I jump into the fiqh of ghusl and the fiqh of janaza also, and it's, not, it's an awkward issue to say, it's a morbid thing to say, but it needs to be said, especially to those that are at a high risk, that it is, appropriate for all of us, especially those at a high risk, to sit down with our family members and have the very awkward conversations about what if we don't go through this, this plague? What is going to happen if we move on? And I remind myself and all of you to be firm and strong and to show your iman and to explain to your loved ones that, hey, whether I'm here or not, Allah will take care of you. I don't take care of you. Allah is the Rabb. Allah is the one who is Malik al-Mulk. Allah is the one who is Razzaq. Not me, not, your, not you, anybody. Allah is the Razzaq. And so if I am not here, then the one who took care of you while I'm alive will take care of you when I'm not here. And you give them the advice that you want to give them. This is also the time to cleanse your heart of any hatred, of any issues that you might have had. This is also the time to write your wills down. We don't want to make life more complicated. You know, already there's going to be tensions for those of us that move on. We want to make things very, very simple and easy. We also want to make sure that our medical uh, issues are very clearly communicated to our loved ones, especially for example, do we want to be intubated or not? Or what is gonna happen if we're on life support? You know, we have to, these are choices, very difficult choices, and we don't want our, our, our children, our loved ones deciding this. We wanna just make, make up our own decisions and communicate to them before that time comes so that they can say, hey look, this is what he or she wanted and let's honor uh, their request. And these are conversations you have to have, and these are thoughts that you have to have um, as you communicate to your uh, loved ones. One. So with that long prelude, now we get to the issue of ghusl and uh, janazah. And realize that we are now talking about the ghusl in particular of those who have passed away because of this virus, COVID-19 or the coronavirus. And of course the issue comes, the problems of doing ghusl for a body that is potentially um, problematic. And this is where we need to understand that it's not just fiqh, it's not just Islamic law that is at play over here. Rather, Islamic law is one aspect. I'm telling you the fiqh, that's one issue. You also have to take into account what the medical experts say. How contagious is a corpse that is that is passed away because of coronavirus? You know, what are the pros and, I mean, what are the issues that we need to be aware of from a medical and scientific standpoint? And of course, we also have to take into account the laws of the land, because in the end of the day, we are living in different lands and different societies, and sometimes we cannot uh, uh, affect what we want because the laws of the state or the province or the, the government that we're under, they might be uh, different than what we, we require. So there are three different issues. All three of them interplay together. I am not here to talk to you about the laws. You know best your countries that you live in and you need to get uh, the laws uh, from them. Uh, I am here to tell you that you need to get expert advice from two different people. Firstly, the fiqh, which is I'm gonna teach you today, inshallah ta'ala, and secondly, medical experts. We need to get the advice of medical experts and of scientists because, and if you've been listening to me for the last week, you know I've been saying this you know, over and over again, that this is not just an issue related to fiqh. Islamic scholars are not the only reference that you need. We will provide you one aspect of the equation. You also need to go to medical experts and to scientists and to uh, uh, people who understand diseases and viruses and get their expertise. And the two together is what will help us form a judgment. And I have to, to, to point out here as well, and again, I've been saying this for the last week and it has caused a lot of issues, but you know, this, this, this trial, of the plague, this, this, this issue that we're seeing around us. 
it's actually showing us many things that we, we did not have frank conversations about. And of them is that within the, the, the scholarly community, we do find you know, different understandings and different paradigms. And someone like myself, I am of a paradigm that says Islamic knowledge has its role in place and modern science and the knowledge that we know from experience, from empirical evidence also has its role and its place. And these two knowledges should not, cannot be in conflict with one another. They are both brought to the table. It is not appropriate for religious scholarship to ignore knowledge that is now certain. We are certain about what a disease is. At least we know that it comes from a virus. At least we know without a shadow of a doubt that diseases are contagious. We know how diseases get transferred overall. We might not know every single detail, but we know that diseases are inherently contagious. For a religious person to come, and they might have great iman, they might have great taqwa, and they say there's no such thing as religious uh, as contagion in, re in religion. We're not supposed to believe in contagious diseases. Based on a misunderstanding of a hadith, for a religious person to say, that we should not fear anything other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And anyone who fears the virus and takes precautions, this person is not a good Muslim, or even worse, this person is a kafir. You know, we have to be honest and blunt here. I, I, I don't want to be harsh upon you know, the, the person, the individual, but I want to be harsh upon the mentality. This is foolishness taking reasonable precautions has nothing to do with believing in Allah or not believing in Allah. You can be the strongest mu'min and still take reasonable precautions. And you can be a kafir and still take reasonable precautions. And you can be a mu'min and not take precautions. And you can be a kafir and not take precautions. The two are separate. And our religion tells us that we tie the camel and we put our trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And again, I am forced to continue to say this because we still have uh, people who use the religion to preach ideas and doctrines that are simply wrong. If you see what is happening in the world, sometimes it is religious gatherings that have spread coronavirus. There is a, uh, in, in Palestine, in Palestine, for example, there was a large, you know, uh, a gathering where some Palestinian brothers in Palestine was shut off. We were hoping that at least one of the perks would be that because they're shut off, the virus would not enter. But lo and behold, there was an Islamic gathering and a group, you know, went out uh, for their da'wah and their tabligh and they went to this gathering and they came back uh, and they entered Palestine after having been infected and they spread this and the same thing happened in Malaysia, the same thing happened and this is not meant to, 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 to nitpick on one particular group, it's meant to nitpick on the mentality, this notion that we only fear Allah, hence we're going to do nothing for the coronavirus. Ya akhi, fear Allah and take precautions against the virus. Why is that an either or? And subhanAllah, this is, you know, the problem isn't just that these types of understandings are harming people, they're literally fatal, literally they're causing the, the loss of life. It's not just that, there is also a bigger problem that needs to be said. When a person who studies medicine and science and knows for a fact that there are viruses and that diseases are contagious and that we need to protect ourselves from them, then sees a person who exudes religiosity, making statements that are not correct, that are frankly foolish, Many people's imans are affected because they see Islam itself in what this person says. And they cannot differentiate, and this is a problem from the person, no doubt about it, they should differentiate this person's fatwa from Islam. But when this person sees many famous people that he looks up to, many people that, that are trained in the Islamic sciences, and they are worthy of respect. I'm not negating that they're good people, but I am saying what we see now is there's multiple camps within the ulama community. There are those camps who believe, hey, you know what? Islam has a place and function, and modern science has a place and function. Allah Azza wa Jal, created this world, he sent down the book, and the both of them are in harmony with one another. That is my paradigm. And then you have others who are saying things that they are essentially rejecting what modern science says, and they're rejecting what doctors say. And unfortunately, innocent Muslims, they sometimes look at that group and they presume the religion itself is saying this, and they end up doubting Islam or, and I have met many people like this, simply rejecting the faith because they could not separate individuals with wrong opinions from the religion. And they said, since these people speak in the name of Islam, therefore in their minds, Islam itself is in their minds, again, backward and foolish and whatnot. And that is why 
it's very awkward because when I say this, obviously I understand the people who look up to those ulama, they read into what I'm saying. They're saying, oh, you are disrespecting, you are putting yourself up. And Allah Azza wa Jal knows, Allah knows it's not my goal, it's not my desire to appear in competition with those ulama. Many of them are my own teachers, many of them I love and I respect. Undoubtedly, and I say this, and Allah is my witness, I'm speaking from my heart, I consider many of them to be more muttaqi than me, more pious than me, more better in ilm and tahajjud and Quran and dhikr than me. But it doesn't change the fact that what they are saying is just not correct. Taqwa is one thing, technical knowledge is another. You know, uh, piety is, is, is one thing, policy is another. And what I am saying is that what we are seeing of this coronavirus and whatnot, these tensions that we try to hide or sometimes surface, these tensions are now being brought to the forefront when you have great ulama saying, don't take any precautions, go ahead and do ghusl with the body, go ahead and do, and you have others saying, no, no, hold on a sec, we need to shut our masajid, now we have to take precautions. And in the end of the day, dear Muslims, I cannot force you to follow any position, it is up to you, but I say that this tension has been around for a long time. In my previous lectures, when I talked about the history of the plagues, I briefly mentioned some of the tensions in the past as well. And I continue to say it is obvious, it is obvious to those of you that are connected to the scholarly class that you have fatawa that are mutually contradictory. You have fatwas that are saying, don't take anything into account, just do everything. And then you have those that are saying, you know what? Our knowledge of science has grown. Our knowledge of diseases has, 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 has gone much more than it was 500 years ago. And therefore, our knowledge of fiqh and our knowledge of sharia has to take this into account. And we then formulate a position based upon both of these knowledges. This is my paradigm. If you accept it, alhamdulillah. If not, alhamdulillah. But I still say, for the time being, err on the side of caution. And then we'll debate this uh, later on. In any case, with this, let us now get to why did I bring all of this up? Because what am I saying? I am saying, and listen to this carefully, you cannot just come to me and ask me, what is the fiqh of washing the corpse of somebody who has died with coronavirus? I am half of the equation. The other half of the equation, we need to know what doctors tell us, how dangerous is the corpse? I don't know how dangerous a corpse is. I don't know the medicine or the medical issues about how contagious the deceased might be. And therefore you need to go to the specialist and get it from them. And based upon what they say, then we will formulate the response put uh, together. So with that in mind, let us give you the fiqh side. And I will also share with you, I was on a conversation today, a national group of uh, specialists, uh, uh, diseases and uh, diseases of, epi of um, uh, uh, epidemics and, and uh, also um, uh, pulmonologists uh, and also um, uh, other doctors uh, that are specializing. I actually spoke with a doctor that dealt with a dozen cases of uh, coronavirus as well uh, about this. And so I will share with you all that we have learned, but realize my speciality is the fiqh side. So realize if there was no coronavirus and this regular corpse. It is obligatory to wash the corpse. This is something that is well known. It is wajib to do ghusl of the uh, corpse. It is fard kifaya to be more precise. And that is that somebody has to wash the dead body and it is a communal obligation. And it is obligatory because our Prophet Sallallahu commanded every time somebody passed away in his lifetime, he commanded. When the man passed away going for Hajj, our Prophet Sallallahu said, اغسلوه. بِمَاءٍ وَالصَّدْرِ Wash him with water and with perfume, uh, the sadr uh, uh, tree uh, that is mixed in the water. And when his own daughter passed away, he said, اِغْسِلْنَهَا Wash her three times or five times or seven times. So he commanded the body uh, to be washed. And of course the default is that the body is shrouded in a particular manner, a way that anybody who is trained in the uh, funeral uh, is known. However, we are now in different circumstances and if we learn from medical experts that the body is contagious of those who have passed away from coronavirus and that one could possibly get the disease, in this case, Sharia allows us to go to a different uh, alternative than doing a proper ghusl. And this is something that is well known in classical fiqh. It's nothing new here. We find these positions in early Islam. It's nothing that we have to change just because of coronavirus. So. First we begin, if we are able to do a proper ghusl the way that it is done, 
then we go with that. Now, what do the medical experts say? Well, I spoke with uh, a group today and also we logged on to the CDC, the C Center for Disease Control, and also we looked at the World Health Organization. And as of yet, and again, this might change day by day, week by week, as of yet, I have read and I have been informed by multiple experts that uh, if standard procedure is followed, and that is to wear what is called PPE, personal protective equipment, and the regular protocols are done, and they have special gloves and special masks and whatnot, and this is standard procedure in these types of cases, that the uh, transferability of this virus is really almost negligible. It is something that is really, it's not a risk factor. And this is what the CDC itself says. And that is because the virus spreads via the, uh, uh, the, the droplets that are exhaled from the body. And of course, when the body is dead, there are no droplets coming out. Now, the CDC does say that if obviously protocol is not followed, there is a very, very, very small possibility that even the body, uh, or if you somehow get to the tissues or something and it gets on you that perhaps it is transferred but that is if you don't follow protocol therefore as of yet as of yet and again this can change day by day what medicine is telling us and what the scientists are telling us and what the health ministries of our governments are telling us is that the deceased who has died from the coronavirus if proper protocol is followed. Now, what is proper protocol? Those that are in the field of washing corpses know. And it is to wear the PPP and to make sure, the PPE, excuse me, and to make sure that the proper gloves and masks and uh, the, the disposable uh, suits are worn. If that is worn, then inshallah ta'ala, there should be no problem. Therefore, if we are able to get to that level and you have the equipment, then the default remains and that is that you do a proper ghusl and you should wash the body properly as per uh, the, the methodology of our religion. And of course, those who know uh, how to wash the bodies, they should follow this procedure. By the way, I also need to point out here that given the fact that the number of deaths might increase uh, in the next few weeks or months, may I suggest communities think about getting uh, uh, young men and young women and training them because we will need uh, people in our communities to take care of this fard kifaya and they need to be trained in both ways. That's why it's just training. You don't need to be a scholar to wash your body. It's just a, a half a day, an hour, two hours of training. You need to be trained in both ways. Firstly, the fiqh of how to do a ghusl of the, of the body and men wash men and women wash women. That's the general default. So you need to learn the fiqh of how to wash the body. Then secondly, you need to be trained by a medical expert. How do you put on the PPE? How do you take it off? How do you dispose of it? What is the procedures to follow? So that is two types of training. And given the fact that our communities might face multiple deaths in the next few weeks or months, we ask Allah for afi and protection, we need to be prepared. And perhaps regular, what we have you know, of our services might not do the job. So may I humbly suggest every community to be proactive before it is too late. And for those in charge of the funeral uh, uh, houses in the Muslim communities, uh, the funeral parlors, that they uh, reach out and they get, get volunteers and they train people that are at lowest risk. And these are young men and young women who are healthy and don't have any other issues and who are eager to, to volunteer for this blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or paid. It's all fine, whatever the community is able to do to get training. So we said the default is to do ghusl and as of yet the CDC is allowing this. Now, suppose in some areas they say you cannot touch the body. And this might vary from state to state or place to place. Or suppose that the funeral uh, place has run out of protective gear, right? Because that's another issue. Then you don't have protective gear. And in this case, you should not touch the body without protective gear. And so we say from a fiqhi perspective, you should not do ghusl and you move on to the next stage. What is the next stage? The next stage, our scholars say, if you cannot do ghusl, it is permissible to pour water without rubbing, without touching. You may simply pour water. And our scholars have said this in multiple scenarios of the past. For example, they said that if a, a lady dies, uh, and she's a traveler, and she's amongst a group of men, none of whom are her mahram, then nobody can touch her, nobody can you know, wash her body. And so our sc classical scholar said, in that case, you know, she is simply, water is poured over her without any rubbing, without any touching. And then she's put in the shroud and put in. So if you cannot do a proper ghusl, we move to level two. Level two is 
pouring water and you can these days use a hose, you can use something from the air, whatever, you can simply, you know, do a proper and you don't have to necessarily uh, remove the clothing and whatnot if that's uh, something that is not possible to do. So that is level two. Now, suppose the medical experts say, or suppose in this particular case that, that we don't even have the facility to do that, we can then move to level three. So again, we're moving down here depending on what? Depending on three things. Again, remember number one, what doctors tell us, what the medical experts tell us. And as of yet, we say ghusl is permissible if you have the equipment. Number two, our own preparedness. What if we don't have the equipment? What if we don't have this? Then we're gonna move down. And then number three, what our, uh, 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 the, the uh, local laws tell us. Because again, perhaps in some states, perhaps in some vicinities, the law will say that you are not allowed to touch the body at all, not even pour water on it. So then we will move down according to what the law as well says. So level two we said was pouring water and at a distance even, you don't have to rub. Level three, which is allowed again very explicitly, and that is to do tayammum, to do tayammum, no water. What if the doctors say, hey look, you know water is what transfer because as of yet we think uh, what we know of the virus, it is the water droplets that transfer. And what if uh, uh, our doctors say, and we don't have the, the equipment for water, ghusl, our doctors say, you know what, uh, the, dry, uh, the dry body, if you wear at least gloves, that if you touch it, then you dispose of the gloves, you should be fine. Then we move to the third level, and the third level will be tayammum, tayammum. Uh, Imam al-Ramli, the famous Shafi'i scholar says in Nihayat al-Muhtaj, وَمَنْ تَعَذَّرْ غُسْلُهُ لِفَقْدِ الْمَاءِ أَوْ لِغَيْرِهِ كَانْ اِخْتَرَقَ أَوْ لُدِغْ وَلَوْ, uh, ولو غُسِّلَ لَتَهَرَّ أَوْ خِيفَ عَلَى الْغَاسِلْ وَلَمْ يُمْكِنْهُ التَّحَفُّذْ يُمَمِّمُ uh, 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 Whoever is not able to be washed with a ghusl, either because they don't have water, or because his body is in such a state that if you were to touch it, it would you know, uh, decay or whatnot. Or one is worried about the washing person, the one who's doing the ghusl, and that he might get harmed. In this case, tayammum is done upon the body. My own teacher, Sheikh uh, Muhammad Mukhtar al-Shanqiti, whom I studied uh, fiqh with in his Umdat al-Fiqh, 10 years, alhamdulillah, I was able to study with him. Uh, Sheikh uh, Shanqiti says that whoever has a disease that the corpse has a disease that we are worried that it might transfer over to the one doing the ghusl in this case. And if the doctors tell us that it is possible that the one washing might get the disease in this case, if it is possible, then tayammum is done. And therefore, if you cannot do ghusl, living or dead, then you move to tayammum. Whether you're alive, whether you're dead, tayammum is a substitute. So what do you do then? You will wear your gloves because again, this is coronavirus, you cannot uh, have, a, uh, you know, without gloves. And again, speak to the doctors, not just me. Remember, don't just listen to this lecture and do something. Listen to this lecture and then also speak to the medical experts of your vicinity about this deceased. Uh, what I'm telling you, if you cannot do ghusl and you cannot pour water, stage three, you do tayammum. How do you do tayammum? You're allowed to wear gloves in this case. The tayammum doesn't have to be with the bare hands. And you will put it on any sandy surface, any, you know, even the, the, the table or something. It's symbolic because the end of the tayammum is symbolic. You will do that and then you will rub the face and then rub the hands. So uh, if you're the ghasid, you're the one doing the ghusl, you will rub the face and then rub the hands and that's it then dispose of the gloves the way that the doctors and the medical experts tell us. That is the third stage, that is tayammum. And so if you can not do ghusl and you cannot pour water, then you will do tayammum. Now, suppose the doctors say, or the body is in such a state where they are, you are told you cannot even come close to it. And suppose, because it might be very possible, in some places we might run out of the protective gear. We might not have uh, glo uh, gloves. We might, and by the way, dear Muslims, already in hospitals, already, and we are in week one, subhanAllah, we are in week one, and we are running out of gloves, we're running out of the masks, uh, as you know, in America. In America, this great land, this land that is supposed to be the pinnacle of, of technology and whatnot, in week one, we are running out of ventilators, and we're running out of masks. What do you think is gonna happen in week five, in week 10, we ask Allah for salam and afia. So it is very likely that uh, in funeral homes and, 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 and cl cleansing facilities, we might run out of protective gear. And then we will be told, you cannot touch the body at all, even for tayammum. And you might not have gloves to do that. In which case, if that is the case, then we go to level four, which is that they will bury the body in a special sealed bag. And in this case, the body will be buried 
as is without ghusl and without uh, tayammum because that was what the law and what the people told us and there's nothing that we can do. وَلَا يُكَلِّفُ اللَّهُ نَفْسًا إِلَّا وُسْعَهَا That Allah does not place a burden on a person more than what he or she uh, can bear and therefore any person whom we are told by medical experts that, you know, the situation now, whether for the facilities, whether because we don't have it, whether because of the body, if we are told that you cannot even come close to the body and the body is going to be in a, in a, in a bag, uh, a special bag that is, you know, the, uh, uh, there for the bodies, the zip bag that is, seals everything, in that case, the body shall be buried as is and no one is sinful and it will be deemed that the rites have been performed and no one should feel that something was wrong because this is as the Sharia says, and this is a principle of fiqh, please, please uh, memorize it. The Sharia, the principles of fiqh say, كُلَّمَا ضَاقَ الْأَمْرُ اتَّسَعَ The more difficult the situation becomes, the easier the Sharia becomes. The more difficult the situation, the easier the Sharia becomes. And therefore, if we are not able to do any of the above, we are forgiven. Now, question, what if there's the body bag and then we are told you can do whatever you want outside of the body bag? Should we pour water or should we put some sand on the outside of the body bag? The response is that in reality that uh, does not make any uh, fiqhi sense. None of the scholars of the past said that you should wash uh, the body that is already shrouded in a way that no water comes in. When they said pour water, they said that pour water over the clothes that a person wears because the purpose of the ghusl is you actually wash the body. If you cannot wash the body, then the purpose is a type of uh, tayammum. Suppose the body is fully covered up. Uh, I mean, I personally would say there is really no need to do anything. However, if somebody says that even symbolically just do a tayammum, there is no need for water, by the way, because there's no ghusl. It makes no sense to pour water on a waterproof Ziploc uh, uh, body bag. But if a person wants to do tayammum over the body bag, I would not say this is something that needs to be done. But if somebody does it for the sake of their heart or whatnot, I would not object to that either. Uh, but really nothing needs to be done and the body may be buried as is and there is no no sin, nor should anybody feel that my relative didn't get the full thing. No, the Sharia allows this to happen and our books of fiqh mention such scenarios, no problem whatsoever. So this is with regards to the ghusl of the uh, body. Once again, uh, number one, Insha'Allah, still we can do ghusl if we wear PPE and we follow proper protocol. If you have the proper protocol, do it. If you can't, number two, pour water from afar, from above, anywhere, and then do the shrouding. If you cannot do that, number three, wear gloves and do uh, tayammum, just the face and the hands. And if you cannot even do any of the above, then number four, and they say you have to wrap the body up and have the special shrouding and whatnot, and of course they have a special bag, of course, this is not the Islamic shrouding. Uh, then you, forget, you are forgiven and you you bury it as is, Allah will forgive you and the, the person has not, no, don't feel that you have done anything short because Allah does not burden you more than you can bear. Okay, the next issue now, that is the ghusl. The next issue is janazah, janazah salah. As for janazah salah, alhamdulillah, there's much more ease and leeway over here and that is because Janazah, alhamdulillah, even in, in classical fiqh, we don't need to redo anything or rethink anything. That, uh, uh, of course, why is it an issue now that uh, in our times we are not allowed to call for congregations? It is against the law in many states, including the one I'm in right now. You cannot have more than two people, you know, come together. So technically, you cannot have 5, 10, 15 people come and pray uh, janazah, even though maybe a few people, the family members, they might be allowed uh, to go and, and bury. But uh, there should be no issue with janazah prayer. Why? because janazah prayer can be done anywhere with any number of people, alhamdulillah. Janazah prayer can be done anywhere. You, you don't have to be in a particular place. Where the body is washed, you can do janazah right there, no problem. In fact, according to many of our early scholars, and this is a position that I also follow, it is permissible to do janazah even without any excuse inside the graveyard. Ibn al-Mundir says that Nafi', the famous student of Ibn Umar, Nafi' uh, uh, mentioned that the wife of the Prophet Aisha and Umm Salama, the both of them, their janazah was prayed in Jannatul Baqi, in Baqi' al gharqa Their janazah was prayed and there was no coronavirus, there was no plague, but the janazah was prayed inside Baqi' al gharqa Abu Huraira came and he led the salah in front of the qabr in Baqi' al gharqa And Ibn Umar uh, was also present over there and didn't say anything. And Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, 
the grands, great grandson of Umar al-Khattab also did this as well. And this is a position that I follow and many scholars follow. No problem if you cannot do the janazah anywhere else, you do it at the grave site or at the place where the body was washed, all of this is allowed. So you may do janazah inside the graveyard. You cannot pray salah and salah is like ruku' and sujood. You cannot pray salah inside the graveyard. But salatul janazah is not the type of salah that is prohibited inside the graveyard. If you need to, whoever is there, you know, the brother is there, the friend is there, the, the family is there, whoever is there, they may do the janazah wherever it is possible. And this doesn't need a new fiqh or fatwa that is Islamic fatwa as well. Janazah does not have a minimum number. Now, of course, we want a large janazah, but we are not allowed to make a call uh, and call people, as you know, and it is foolish to do so. It really is. It goes against the goals of the sharia to do so. And therefore, the janazah will take place with whoever is there. If it's even one person, the one who's washing the body, then even that one person can stand and simply do the janazah, and that will be considered a legitimate salatul janazah. Janazah does not have a minimal number, nor does it have uh, a place that it needs to be uh, done. Now, uh, the other thing as well that uh, we need to discuss is the issue of janaza al ghaib or janaza in absentia. Because what if family members could not come and uh, uh, and, and, and this is already happening in, in, in a number of countries. I know, for example, in England, uh, where family members were told that they cannot even you know, uh, come in large gatherings, even to the graveyard, and only small numbers could come. How about the rest of the family members? How about the rest of the friends? What should they do? Well, realize that. Once again, we don't need any new fatwa or new fiqh over here. The Shafi'i Madhab and the Hanbali Madhab and many ulama, including Imam al-Shawkani and others, they said that janaza ala al-ghaib is something that is allowed without any excuse. So what about when there is an excuse, how about then? So what is janaza ala al-ghaib? It is reported in the uh, Sahih of Imam al-Bukhari that when uh, Najashi passed away, who was Najashi? Najashi was the governor or the ruler or the king of uh, Abyssinia. And Najashi passed away in a faraway land. And uh, our Prophet ﷺ was informed by Jibreel that Najashi passed away. And Najashi passed away in Abyssinia. The Prophet ﷺ announced in the Masjid of Medina that your brother Najashi has passed away and we will do janazah for him. And so he lined up the people and they did salat al-janazah even though Najashi's body was where? Abyssinia. And from this, the Hanbali school, the Shafi'i school, many ulama, they said, this clearly shows that if you want to do janazah ala al-ghaib, you can do so. And this is without any excuse. Imagine now when loved ones are dying and we might not be able to pray, what will the family do? We say to them, no problem. Insha'Allah ta'ala in this time of distress and difficulty, follow the position that so many ulama said, even if you're not Hanbali or Shaf, in my opinion, in this case, it's no problem. You know, you may do Salat al janaza al-Ghaib, which means wherever you are, you gather your family and friends, don't have a large gathering, whoever is there, don't call people. We're supposed to be in social isolation. Whoever is living together, all the family and friends individually in their houses, they can stand, face the qibla, and they will do one person be the imam and the others behind him. And they will do takbir, four takbirat. And then they will say, Assalamu uh, alaikum, Assalamu alaikum. The first takbirah will be Surah Al Fatiha. The second takbirah will be the Salah Ibrahimiyya, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala ali Muhammad. The third takbirah will be a dua for the deceased. And if you don't know the ones from the sunnah, then say anything from the heart, just make dua for the deceased. The fourth takbirah, Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fil akhir hasana wa qina adab al-nar. And then you will make the salam on both sides or on one side, both of these are permitted. And then the salah is over. There is no ruku, there is no sujood. You have to do wudu and face the qibla and that is it. And so salat al-janaza ala al-ghaib is something that we should be aware of and uh, perform for those amongst us who pass away and we cannot physically uh, be there uh, for them. Jayid. So this we've talked about ghusl, we've talked about uh, Salat al-Janazah. We also need to get to the issue of the burial itself. And again, ideally, as we mentioned, as I mentioned, uh, the people who study Islamic fiqh and the people who know this, they know that there's a particular shroud and there's a particular mechanism. If we're able to do this, this is sunnah by the way, it is not wajib. If you don't have the shroud, even in regular circumstances, as long as the body is covered in some manner, and that is the bare minimum. So if we're not able to have the five or seven shrouds, if we're not able to have the white and the way that it is typically done, that is not 
uh, uh, wajib, and there are many times in history. In fact, even in the Battle of Uhud, multiple people passed away, and there wasn't even enough cloth to cover them up. So as long as something is covered in the body, and these days we have the body bags and whatnot, so that is not going to be an issue. However, an, another issue might come, can we bury multiple people in the same grave, especially if the number of deaths increase and we don't have space, what can we do then? Realize that once again, we don't need to reinvent fiqh. Alhamdulillah, our fiqh has discussed these issues many, many centuries ago. And we know that even in the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, even in the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that uh, some people uh, in the Battle of Uhud, too many people passed away. And so the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, bury two or three people together, as many as you can. And so in one grave, multiple people were put. There is no problem whatsoever uh, in this regard. And this is something once again that goes uh, back to, uh, again, it doesn't need any new ijtihad. If the situation gets difficult and we don't have space, or it becomes logistically difficult to keep on burying, you know, digging and burying. And you know, dear Muslims, plagues always brought about this issue. In Islamic history, every time there was a plague, there were some problems with burials and our scholars overlooked it for the time. No big deal, it happens, what can you do? So if, and we seek Allah's refuge, but if the number of deaths increase such that uh, we will not have the time or the logistics or the energy or the space to have every single person buried in one grave, no problem. Our Sharia allows this even in the Battle of Uhud. And by the way, the Battle of Uhud, they had the time, but it was just time consuming energy. And the Prophet allowed people, two or three people, to be buried in the same Khabar. So how about now when we might not have that, you know, the, the luxury, so no problem, multiple people may be buried in one uh, grave if the situation uh, calls uh, for this. Um, I want to also finish up with some other related uh, issues as well, now that we are talking about um, uh, 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 the fiqh pertaining to uh, the, the uh, coronavirus as well, and that is that, okay, what if uh, the person is being buried and, uh, you know, the family is back at home and they cannot see the burial, is it allowed for me to take my, my iPhone or something like this and simply show the family, show the, you know, the wife or the, 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 the daughter or the children, can I show, or anybody, can I show them the burial procedure and is it gonna be something that is halal in Islam? And the response is that, yes, there is no haraj whatsoever, there is no sin whatsoever in broadcasting uh, the funeral uh, procession and the funeral burial live to family members as long as Islamic decorum as long as dignity is observed, in and of itself, there is no shari uh, prohibition about uh, broadcasting it. But obviously, we remind the family, remind the people that what they say has to be something that is acceptable to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and that uh, they don't uh, you know, uh, do things that are prohibited, which is like wailing for the dead and saying things of a nature that are uh, un-Islamic. As well, now that we're talking about, again, all of these issues pertaining to uh, coronavirus, and of course the main thrust of today's issue uh, was about, um, uh, was about uh, the fiqh of janaiz and the fiqh of, uh, and the fiqh of uh, funeral prayers, but because we're talking about this, let us also quickly talk about one or two other issues before our time runs up related to uh, the fiqh of coronavirus, the fiqh of the times of coronavirus, and of them is uh, the fiqh of Jumu'ah Salah and what is to be done uh, for uh, Jumu'ah Salah. And uh, uh, I want to read to you the fatwa that the Fiqh Council of North America, which is the oldest uh, body of uh, Fiqh uh, councils in North America, it is uh, the first body that was formed for the, fiqh, uh, for the issues of Fiqh pertaining to North America. And uh, I'm very uh, humbled and honored to be uh, the least really um, uh, per person on there, but Alhamdulillah, I'm a member of the Fiqh Council. And uh, today we convened online and uh, we uh, unanimously agreed to uh, a fatwa pertaining to the prayer and the funeral. And what I have just said to you, by the way, uh, is essentially uh, an explanation of that fatwa for the funeral. I will now read to you from the Fiqh Council's official uh, fatwa about the prayer when it comes to uh, uh, this uh, situation of the coronavirus. And the Fiqh Council has said that given the extenuating circumstances surrounding the coronavirus crisis, the Fiqh Council of North America convened online and has unanimously issued the following statements regarding Friday prayers and communal salah. The Fiqh Council states, the suspension of the communal prayers in the masjids 
and all religious activities in person is a necessary matter in light of the overall goals of the Sharia. Ah. And not only is there no sin in doing so, rather it is sinful to flout such regulations and to bring risk to oneself and to others. Of the primary goals of the Sharia ah is the preservation of life. And this ban of social intermixing is not a ban on the salah, which is fard ayn, individual obligation, but rather a ban on the communal prayer, the salat al-jama'ah, which according to the majority of ulama is not fard ayn and can be lifted for many reasons, including slight hardship. For example, if there is rain, our Prophet said, pray in your houses. So the ban is not on salah, the ban is on communal salah, and there's no problem. In fact, the Fiqh Council says, to proceed without caution in the lands where it has been banned is in fact sinful. And the Fiqh Council says, this suspension should remain until medical experts give indications that it can be lifted. The Fiqh Council of North America says, listen to this, this is a matter for medical experts to assess, not religious authorities. And this is what my paradigm is. We, as people trained in fiqh and in tafsir and in hadith and in theology and in the classical sciences, are not the people you should be coming to to ask us about when the ban should be lifted and when we can have jama'at again. That's not my forte. It's not what I have studied. When the medical experts tell us that it is dangerous for people to be intermixing together in this manner, then we have to say we hear and we obey. We are not experts in this regard. This is something goes back to them, not to us. This is what the Fiqh Council says and what I believe. Uh, the Fiqh Council then says, while in-person activities should be suspended, Religious lectures and all other classes and even khutbah sermons can and should be delivered online and distributed to the community. We advise every community that it should be connected with its religious leaders during this time of crisis and communities should do their best to maintain some semblance of activities online. In other words, we advise all masajid that have had communities in the past to continue their services to their communities online so that Islamic education, tarbiyah, uh, iman building, you know, uh, teaching them the, the, the adhkar and duas and whatnot, it continues because we need always to increase our knowledge. So the Fiqh Council says we advise all these services to continue online. However, very important, listen to this, the khutbah, the Friday sermon that is being broadcast even if live, does not take the ruling of a khutbah for those who listen to it from their houses. This is because there is unanimous consensus amongst all the legal schools that an unreasonable gap between the lines, between the imam and the lines, uh, breaks a congregational prayer. Hence, there is no jama'ah ah when many households are praying many miles apart. As well, in particular for the Friday prayer, the Jumu'ah, the default is that Jumu'ah is done in major masajid and that Jumu'ah is meant to gather Jama'ah, the, the, the people. Therefore, it is not permitted for people who are watching the sermon remotely to then pray two rak'ah Friday prayers even if they are listening live. Rather, those in their homes will pray four rak'at dhuhr in lieu of regular Jumu'ah. Meaning, you may listen to our live broadcasts, you may listen to any khutbah recorded or live, but if you're at home, you cannot consider that khutbah to be an actual khutbah for you, in which case you will pray to rak'ah. No, it's an Islamic advice, which is, happens to be a khutbah for where it's being given. For you at home, it's a religious advice and then you will pray dhuhr with the sunnah, with the nafil and four rak'ah dhuhr. And of course you can pray jama'ah for dhuhr, four rak'ah. Now the fiqh council says, while some schools of law did allow three or four people to perform jumu'ah with some conditions and hence according to those schools, it would not be invalid to establish jumu'ah in individual houses if these conditions and numbers were met, the Fiqh Council does not encourage this practice unless extenuating uh, individual circumstances exist that make this option better than the other options. The goal of the ban on social intermingling would be defeated if mini Jumu'ahs began, uh, services began in other people's houses, end quote. In other words, what the Fiqh Council is saying is that some scholars, very few, 
allowed Jumu'ah with three or four people. And if therefore some family of mashallah four, five, seven people living together, if they were to have a mini Jumu'ah in their houses, and so the father stands up and his two sons are there and the mother or the daughter in the back and they're all doing this, from the perspective of that very, very, very small group, this is a valid Jumu'ah. By the way, the majority would say no. The majority would say the concept of Jumu'ah like this doesn't exist because Jumu'ah is done in masajid that is jami' and it is done by congregating the people. And this is the position I also follow. But some very small ulama said it is allowed. So if the family does this, the fiqh council says, we are not saying it is invalid, we're not saying it's batil, but we encourage families not to do this. Why? For multiple reasons. Of them is that uh, the purpose of Jumu'ah is to gather people together and to come to the main masjid. Of them is that generally speaking, the person who's not trained in the khutbah might not give as effective of a khutbah as the actual you know, khatib will be giving. Of them is that once people hear that, oh, so-and-so is giving a khutbah and it's my neighbor, oh, I'm gonna come too, I'm gonna come too. What's gonna happen instead of not having social intermingling, we're gonna have 50 houses where people are coming and driving to, and people are going to say, oh, I liked he, his son gave a khutbah last week that was really good, more people are going to come. The whole purpose is we don't intermingle. The whole purpose is we isolate ourselves to the maximum possible uh, amount. And therefore, if we start popping up mini Jumu'ahs everywhere, it defeats the purpose. Dear Muslims, our religion does not tell us to act foolishly. And now that we know various things that our predecessors did not know, there is no problem. You see, and we conclude now because time is up. Um, the issue comes that you have groups of people, you have sometimes even ulama, whom I respect, I love, we really do not doubt their sincerity. They keep on coming to this point and they say, in the history of Islam, plagues have happened. And it is true that masjids at times were closed as a reaction, that there were no people to pray, people died. But never in Islamic history were masjids closed proactively. Never in Islamic history around the globe did people say, oh, because of the plague, because we don't want social mixing, we will close the masjid. So this group of ulama, is asking for precedent, it's called. Precedent is a technical term, any law student knows this. We don't want to be the first to do this. We want somebody to have done it before. And I'll be honest with you, you will not find that type of precedent. You can try to hunt for it, and in my previous lectures, I kind of sort of did try to throw out tidbits here and there, but I'm gonna be honest with you. You will not find any classical scholar that says, for fear of coronavirus, for fear of the plague, shut down Jumu'ah. That's the truth. But you see, those scholars were dealing with the world as they knew it with the knowledge they had. And we thank Allah we had them. We thank Allah for their efforts and we build from their efforts. The question is, now that we know what they did not know, and now that we understand very well to the level of certainty, you see, that's the whole point here. This isn't uh, uh, knowledge that is in Arabic called vanni, it's a conjecture, it's a hypothesis. No, this is certain. We know that there are diseases that are carried by this thing called the virus. We know virus spreads by the physical vicinity. Back in those days, they literally thought there's some bad air around you, or they thought that whatever, something festers and it comes. Read Ibn Sina with my utmost respect for these types of ulama as well. Read the classical uh, medical doctors. They did not understand plagues, even though they knew it was contagious. But how they interpreted it is different than what we know. Even the doctors of the past, much less the ulama didn't understand. Now the question here, here you have two groups of scholars and the one group is saying if there's no precedent we're not going to do anything. I respect that and that is something that we understand but you see even as I respect it I point out that is not the way forward. I am not attempting to diminish the, the, the erudite knowledge of that group. I'm never attempting to cast aspersions on their niyyah. But I'm saying Islamic fiqh needs to take into account 
the certain knowledge we have as well. And the real faqih, the real jurist, and I'm not amongst them, I'm the lowest amongst them. I'm of that paradigm, but I'm a mere student of knowledge. I'm not claiming that I am the one, a'udhu billah, challenging mufti so-and-so and sheikh so-and-so. No, they're all above me in iman and taqwa, but it's a clash of paradigms. And I'm not the only one. Great ulama, uh, the, the councils of Islamic yani scholarship around the globe, many of them, alhamdulillah, they are on this paradigm and they are saying, now that we know what a virus is and how it spreads, we don't need precedent to form this position because this is what common sense and Islamic law dictates. We want to preserve lives, not kill people. We want to preserve our children and grandchildren. We want to live in this dunya and the akhirah. And our sharia does not ask us to be foolish. What is being uh, suspended is not salah. If it was the actual salah, well, that's a whole different issue. It's not. It is salah in congregation. It is coming together in congregation. It is physically touching one another, we, uh, uh, shaking hands for people that don't live in the same house. All of this should be suspended and it is of the goals of the Sharia to do so if you follow this paradigm and I'm definitely of that paradigm. If you really don't want to, what can be done? May Allah Azza wa Jal reward you for your sincerity, but it is not the right way and a religion does not, your religion and my religion does not ask you to be foolish. Just like you wouldn't throw yourself off of a bridge and say, Allah is the one who will protect me. No, you don't do that in the first place. You take precautions, you don't throw yourself off of the bridge. Even when you're gonna do something dangerous, our Prophet walked into the battle of Uhud, the battle of, of Badr. In the battle of Uhud, he wore two armors, two, double protection because he, he knows he's going to face uh, a, a threat over there. Is anybody going to say that our Prophet Sallallahu wearing armor shows that he doesn't have tawakkul in Allah, he doesn't have iman in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. SubhanAllah, you wear your armor, you have your sword, you train, and then when you have to face the enemy, you fight with valor, with courage. You don't just throw your sword away and say, oh Allah, I want shahada, and you die right there. That's not Islam. Islam calls for the preservation of life, the preservation of intellect, the preservation of dignity, and the preservation of religion. All of these, we preserve them, and therefore, I humbly, humbly keep on reminding you, listen to those ulama who also want to take into account other sciences and then bring forth a fiqh that is conducive to the sciences of our times. In today's lecture, I presented to you basic issues with regards to the ghusl, with regards to the janaza, with regards to the uh, salah and whatnot, and this takes into account what we know of this world. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect all of us. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us iman and tawfiq. We ask Allah to grant us wisdom. We ask Allah azza wa jal to grant us the best of manners. We ask Allah azza wa jal to be our hadi, to be our mawla. We have no mawla other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We ask Allah azza wa jal that he does not show us in our loved ones that which will cause us grief and harm. We ask Allah azza wa jal that our children and grandchildren are protected. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that our loved ones, all of them are protected. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to live as Muslims and to die as mu'mins and as shaheeds. If Allah chooses us to die in this time frame, we ask Allah azza wa jal to be given the, 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 the rewards of a shaheed. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that the last phrase that we say in this world be the phrase of La ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah. And with this we come to the conclusion of today's Q&A session. I will inshaAllah ta'ala see you in our next uh, sessions. Jazakumullahu khairan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.